I'll let you have that. I said reality does not consist of a problem or problems. <clears throat> problems are to reality what atoms are to tables. You experience tables, not atoms. An atom is a concept which is obtained by abstraction from reality. Problem is an abstraction extracted from reality by analysis. What's reality? Reality are systems of problems. Problems which are intimately interrelated and interacting. And therefore, if you take reality and by analysis separate it out into individual problems and then solve each problem taken separately, what do you know about what you've done to reality? You haven't treated it as effectively as possible. What we have to do is learn how to treat systems of problems, not problems taken separately. And that's an entirely different methodology than what we teach in school. By the way, there's a technical term for a system of problems called a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, what we ought to be teaching people is how to engage in the management of messes or mess management. We have a school for that. You have a school for that. <laughs> problems are abstractions, and we don't let kids know that. We treat it as though they're reality. So look at the sequence. Reality is a mess, which is a system of problems. Abstract out of that the elements, we get a problem. So it's unreal. Now we take away from the problem the information needed to formulate it and give it to a kid and ask him to solve it. That's an exercise. Then you take away the reason for wanting to solve it. You don't tell them why it's important to do. And just say it's a question, answer it. And that becomes a question. What education is about is how to answer questions. Not how to solve messes, but the real world is about how the hell to formulate a mess so you can do something about it. Not how to answer questions. But even here, we pull an abomination. When you got an examination in school and you read the questions, your first thing that you did was ask yourself a question. Do you remember the question that you asked yourself? You might not want to admit it. What answer? What answer does the examiner expect? Right? The question wasn't, what's the answer? The question is, what answer does the examiner expect? Now, there's one thing you can be absolutely sure of. If you give somebody the answer they expect, it can't be creative. Because it's already known. We kill creativity by teaching kids to give the answer that we expect. Let me tell you one final story which got me so furious that I've been writing about it for the last 25 years. I have three children. A son is the oldest and two daughters. At a time when my middle daughter, who's now in her 30s, was 13 years old, I came home from work one night, and she greeted me in the little family room that I came through from outside. And after that, I said, Daddy, I've got a problem for homework tonight, mathematics I can't solve. Do you think you could help me immediately after uh, class? After uh, a supper, I said, sure. So uh, after supper, I forgot all about it, went to my study, which was right next door to the family room with a connecting door. Door was closed, and I went to work. After I'd been working about a half hour, she came in and stood beside the desk, and I looked up, and I said, what's the matter, Karen? She said, remember you said you are going to help me with the problem. I said, oh, yeah, I forgot all about it. Okay, get the problem and bring it in showing my impatience, and so she got nervous and ran into the other room and she brought me a typewritten sheet of paper which had the nine dot problem on it, okay? It had the nine dots at the top of the paper. You must all remember this problem. And it had typewritten instructions. It said, take a pen or pencil and put it on one of the nine dots. And without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper, draw four straight lines that will cover all nine dots. 
I look at it, oh my God, Karen, I did this when I was a kid. She said, fine, just show me the answer. <laughs> I said, I don't remember the answer, but it'll only take me a minute to find out. So I said, first, I better find out what the problem is. I don't remember. So I said, one, two, three, four, and there's an uncovered dot. So I said, well, it's got a trick. It must be that you have to have two diagonals. So I then got started with one diagonal, two diagonals, four, and now I made progress because I had two dots on the cover. <laughs> now, I fiddled around for about five minutes, and I couldn't find the solution. I got impatient, and I said, well, look, you said it's an extra credit problem, so it's not important. i got a hell of a lot of work to do. Why don't you forget about it? She grabbed a sheet of paper out from in front of me walked out indignantly in the room, saying audibly as she left, and you're supposed to be a university professor. <laughs> she sat, went down into the next room, the family room, with the connecting door open, and I went back to work. A few minutes later, I could hear her crying next door. Now, it's very hard for me to work with a 13-year-old crying next door. So I got up and walked in, and I said, what's the matter now, Karen? She said, I'm ashamed to go to school without a solution to that problem. And then I stopped, and I realized how important it was to her. I said, okay, I'm sorry. Come back, and this time we'll make a real effort. Well, she very skeptically got up with a sheet of paper, sniffling. I took the sheet of paper with her, walked back into our room. I sat her down across the desk from me, stood up behind the desk and cleared it ceremoniously to show her that I really meant it. I was standing there with this sheet of paper in my hand, like this, I said, Karen, is this a puzzle or a problem? She said, I think it's a puzzle. I said, that's right, it is a puzzle. I said, what's the difference between a puzzle and a problem? She said, I don't know. I said, well, try. She said, a puzzle is harder than a problem. I said, no. I said, there are lots of problems we can't solve, and nothing is harder than that. So it's not hardness. She said, well, maybe it's a puzzle has only one answer, and a, 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 problem, a puzzle has only one answer, and problems have lots of answers. I said, no. There are many puzzles that have lots of answers, and many problems that have only one. She shook herself a little bit and said, well, I guess I don't know. I said, okay, it's one of the few things I do know. A puzzle is a problem that you cannot solve because of something that you incorrectly assume. That's why a puzzle always has a trick. The trick is to recognize the incorrectly imposed constraint. Remove it, then the solution is obvious. That's why when you're shown the solution to a puzzle you couldn't solve, you always feel like a fool. Right? So I'm standing there waving this sheet of paper. I said, the reason I can't solve this thing is I'm making some stupid assumption. I looked at my hand, I said, oh my God. Okay, Karen, here's the solution. I took this sheet of paper and did this to put this down. Okay? Took this sheet of paper and did this. I'm doing it roughly here so I can get an idea. Took a felt tip pen. There's one line. Two, three, four. She was delighted. Okay. She grabbed for the sheet. I said, wait a minute. She said, what's the matter? I said, we can do it with one line. She said, no, 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 no. The problem is four lines. I said, now look, you made me stop my work to show you how to do it with four lines, so you stop your work while I show you how to do it with one. Well, she showed no interest, but she stood there. I took the sheet, and now I did this. Then drew one line across, and of course what came out was this. She grabbed the sheet and ran off before I tried anything else. <laughs> I got back to work, and that was the end of that. Now, the next night when I came home, I came in through the same room, and by sure chance she was there alone again. My other two kids were out. This time she didn't look up, and she didn't say hello to me. I knew something was wrong, so I stood there a minute, and I said, Hello, Karen, and she grunted at me. Without looking up, I said, what's the matter? She said, nothing. 
I said, all right, come on, tell me. What happened in class? She said, with what? I said, with the nine-dot problem. Oh, she said, I don't want to talk about it. I said, why not? She said, you're going to get mad. I said, yep, I probably will. But I won't get mad at you. And then she looked up for the first time. She said, you promise? I said, yeah. Now tell me what happened. And she did. She said, the teacher called on the class and asked if anybody had a solution to this problem. She said, about six of us raised our hands. So she called on one of the other girls in the class and asked her to come in front of the room and show the class a solution. And what the other girl did was this. She showed me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four. I said, oh my God, that's a solution I used to know when I was a kid. You see, the assumption is you can't go outside the square. I didn't tell you you couldn't anymore, and I told you you couldn't fold the paper. In fact, later, when I told my six-year-old daughter about this, she said, why don't you get a great big fat pen and do it with a dot? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what happened? She said, the teacher congratulated the girl, said, that's right, and told her to sit down and started to talk about something else. And I said, what'd you do? She said, I raised my hand, and the teacher stopped and said, what's the matter, Karen? And I said, I have a different solution to that problem. He just said, don't be silly, Karen. There's only one solution. You've seen it. Now, don't interrupt the class. So I said, what'd you do? She said, I waited a minute, and I raised my hand again. And the teacher said, Karen, are you going to talk about that problem anymore? Because if you are, I'm going to punish you. I said, what'd you do? She said, I said, Miss So-and-so, I'm really very sorry. I don't want to make you mad, but I really do have a different solution to the problem, and I know I do, because my father showed it to me, and he's a university professor. <laughs> <laughs> Teacher said, Karen, I don't care who your father is. That problem has one solution. Have you seen it? Now, you stop interfering. If you do it again, I'm going to put you out of the room. So I said, what did you do, Karen? She said, I waited a minute and raised my hand again. <laughs> Teacher stopped. She said she was really mad. She said, what is it now, Karen? And I said, Miss Sonson, I really am very sorry, but I really do have another solution. And furthermore, I can do it with one line. <laughs> well, at this point, the class came apart because now the kids couldn't believe it. The kids were involved. One line. The teacher was embarrassed. She didn't know what to do. The kids obviously wanted to see this thing. So the teacher said, all right, Karen, if you want to make a fool of yourself, come to the front of the room and show the class the solution on the blackboard. <laughs> My daughter said, I'm sorry, Miss So-and-so, I can't do it on the blackboard. I need an easel and a pad of paper. And the teacher said, why? She said, I can't explain to you, but if you let me have an easel and a pad, I'll show you. Teacher was furious, went to the closet, got an easel and pad, brought it out, and my daughter got in front of it, very carefully drew the nine dots. And then she took the paper up like this, just like this, and began to fold. She said, wait a minute, what are you doing? She said, I'm folding the paper. Teacher said, you can't do that. My daughter said, why not? The instructions didn't say I couldn't. And then the teacher said to her, I don't care what the instructions said, that's what I meant. Now you sit down. Isn't that incredible? That daughter, that year, gave me a birthday present. It was a book called 1010 Solutions to the Nine Dot Problem. <laughs> God! Uh, have you ever read Jules Henry, Culture Against Man? You ought to read it. He talks about the massacre of infants in the school system. How, through education, we destroy the capacity of people to think. What we teach them, he said, is to think the way we want them to think. Not to think. We destroy creativity. Every once in a while it breaks through and it's just marvelous. I had a wonderful experience this year. I got tired of reading lousy handwriting. So in my introductory course at the graduate level this year, I gave him a typewritten set of instructions. I said, when your paper comes in this year, I want it double-spaced, 
on a typewriter, double spaced typing on eight and a half by 11 clear white paper with margins of one inch on all sides, plus or minus no more than an eighth of an inch. I said, is that clear? They said, yes. The papers came in. They were all exactly what I wanted, except one. One of them came in typed this way. <laughs> the end of the paper, he said, aha, I got you, didn't I? <laughs> I gave that kid an A in the course and told him he could skip the rest of it. He didn't do that. <laughs> but I told the rest of the class, you try it and you'll flunk because it's no longer creative. <laughs> okay, have a shot at it. Go ahead. I can go on talking about education indefinitely, but uh, okay. yeah. Uh, what happens if the tuition keeps on going higher and higher? How can we accommodate a small group of people and educate at a small group level to get away from this mass production method? How do we constrain economically, uh, speaking practically now? Ideally, we should all go to a very small group and, and do the kind of thing that you indica indicated. Uh, but how, how are we going to... See, the assumption is you, we start with the normal arithmetic. You got a teacher for every 20 students now, and now you're talking about small groups of 8 to 10 students, so you need twice as many teachers. But just look at the assumptions that are based in that. First of all, you're assuming that a teacher is always present. Right? I don't mean use particularly, because this is a very common question. That a teacher has a fixed teaching load, and you have a whole set of assumptions which if you turn over removes the problem. Right? In our program we have no courses and no curriculum. Every student designs his own education when he comes in, and he has to get approval by a faculty committee, but he designs it. Okay? We determine when he's ready to get the degree by what he has done, not by examination. He organizes cells, he can learn on his own, he can attend courses, he can do it any way he wants to. He can put together any combination of pedagogical tools he wants to. We have the highest ratio of students to faculty of any graduate department in the school and the largest PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania. It's not a matter of ratios. It's a matter of structuring the system. I spend three quarters of my time in research. It's research done on a contract with the University of Pennsylvania. And I have 30 students working on that research with me. They learn a hell of a lot more out of working with me on those problems than they do out of classes. They fight to get the right to do that. I don't have to have them in a course where I'm going to learn something. Let me tell you a story, it's an absolutely true story. I had a student about five years, a little more than five years ago, Bob Court, bright as holy hell. We had just completed some work on alcoholism. We had developed a theory, a psychodynamic theory, to explain alcoholism and for its treatment. We had tested it and it worked. We were very excited. He came in, he said, damn, he said, that's marvelous stuff. He said, you know, I think it would work on narcotics. I said, yeah, that's interesting. I think it would too, but it would need some adaptation on drugs. He said, is it all right if I try to develop a project in that area? I said, well, how? What are you going to do? See, the, I work in alcoholism was supported by a company that makes alcoholic beverages. He said, well, I'd like to try to write a proposal of some kind and submit it to the government. I said, fine, that's great, but... Uh, What's the problem? He said, I don't know anything about narcotics. I said, well, how long do you think it'll take you? He said, a couple of months. He said, well, we got enough money around. I'll support you for three months. So for three months, he disappeared. I didn't see him. Came back three months later with a proposal that he had written. It was submitted to NIH, National Institute of Health, and he got a $350,000 grant to do the study. The student. But that's not the interesting part. The medical school invited him to give a course to doctors on the treatment of narcotic addiction. Three months. He was a leading expert on the subject in the university. Nobody had taught him a damn thing. God, we just don't exploit the capacity of people to learn. We insist on teaching them. 
And sometimes you have to. I'm not saying you never teach, but you only teach when somebody feels he needs it. It really is an inefficient way of learning. Your students get a grade? Hmm? You actually give a hard grade to a student at the end? They don't get a grade in the normal sense. They are graded by the other students, by how good a teacher they are, as I told you. Yeah, but when a guy makes a transfer from the University of Pennsylvania, for whatever reason, into the South, say. That doesn't happen at the doctoral level. Do you have, in any university, credits at the doctoral level are non-transferable. So it's not a problem. Graduate. Yeah, it's all graduate. You got the there's the kind of students out there. You got the ones that are self starters and so on. Uh, and you're talking about. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> Somebody always says, "Yeah, you're the Ivy League, and you got real bright students, and so on." We have done this in rural villages of Mexico with illiterates, and it works. Motivated. Yeah. I wish there were time to tell you, but let me just tell you a little bit about Mexico, okay? Uh, the last Secretary of Education of Mexico, Fernando Solano, is a very close personal friend. We have worked together for many years. He used to be Secretary of the National University, where I worked. And then he moved into government and went up through various stages and became Secretary of Education. When he became Secretary of Education, he came out and we spent several days together. And he said, I really want to do something about education in Mexico, but I don't know how the hell I can do it. He said, let me describe the problem. He said, the Mexican Constitution guarantees an education of at least five years to every child in Mexico. He said, only 50% of them get it. He said, I'm obligated to provide it to the other 50%. But he said, I don't have the money to build the schools and to hire the teachers to go into some 15,000 villages that have no educational facilities in them. What can I do? I said, the first thing you got to do is stop thinking about conventional education, because you can't do it. You just told me you can't. So first of all, let's eliminate a school, right? We're not going to have any school. We'll use any space we can find. The Sokolo, which is the open square in the middle of town. I happen to know, I said, most of these towns have unused jails. Why don't we use the jail? Or the town hall in every village has had a huge entrance lobby. It's always bigger than the rest of the building. So why don't we put classroom in the lobby of the building? We don't care anywhere. Doesn't make a difference where we put it. He said, okay, if we do that, he said, where are we going to get the teachers? I said, why don't you get a kid who's graduated from a high school in the nearest village? Bring him in and give him the job of teaching the kids in that village. Now, what do you offer him, he said. I can't pay him very much. He said, well, you pay him enough to live on. But you guarantee him a college of ed education when he's done, which is free in Mexico. So what you will do is provide him with a stipend so he can go to any university in Mexico of his choice and have enough money to live until he gets his degree. He teaches two years and then goes to university. He said, that's a hell of an interesting idea. I'm going to try it. So he took 1,000 villages, and he announced his intention of doing this thing. He put out an ad, and he got kids applying in the you know, thousands. The teachers got a hold of him, the teachers' union, and said, what the hell are you trying to do? And he had a national strike on his hand. Now that was a devastating strike, because Fernando Solano would be president of Mexico today if it hadn't been over that strike. It's the largest union in Mexico. And they went out to get him because they said, you're trying to destroy our profession. He said to them, if you're willing to go to those villages and teach for the amount that I'm going to pay those kids, I'll be happy to use you. And of course, they refused. He refused to give in, and he eventually broke the strike. He put the system in 1,000 villages. Now, everybody was out to show that it was nonsense. After two years, the Educational Testing Service was brought in. And they gave standard aptitude tests to the kids in these 1,000 village schools against the kids at the same level in the school system in Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterey, and so on. There was no significant difference in their performance. Absolutely none. Today it's in 15,000 Mexican villages. We've got to break the bonds of our conception of how you have to do it. You have to have a teacher? Hell no. 
That one kid from high school that comes into a village with a group of 30 students at all age levels, he doesn't sit there lecturing to them, he just helps them learn. They provide them with materials and he's a resource that they use as they see fit. Yes? Are you encouraged by the partnerships in education are up business and industry and military. Not very much, no. Uh, the most encouraging thing I see is a very small number of corporations, a number of them European, that have gotten interested in education because of the recognition of the fact that they can no longer depend on universities and the public school system to provide the people they need in the future. We now have in the United States the first two for-profit universities businesses that are set up as corporations and they're going to have to uh, account for themselves they're going to have to be effective and productive in order to survive they are surviving very well right now the fact is that you know educational system just doesn't have to account for itself as i mentioned to you before the university professor in a major university teaches six hours a week it's incredible to consider that a workload Especially when the courses are one he's taught 10, 15 times before, it's ridiculous. Our whole concept of work, that's why I say a university is created to provide the faculty with the quality of work life it wants. It has nothing to do with the education of the students. We arrange the student for our convenience. Just look at the scheduling of classes at the university. You have more than 50% of the classes in the university are given on Monday and Wednesday. Less than 5% on Friday. And the rest Tuesday, Thursday. Why? Has that got something to do with education? Hell no. Professors want to be able to take a long weekend. It's that simple. And on and on and on. You can go and show it. all the decisions that are made are for the convenience of the faculty member. I sat for a full year through faculty meetings and kept a record. I recorded the meetings. At the end of the year, I pointed out that in eight faculty meetings, the word student had never been mentioned. Not once. I sat in meetings in the College of Engineering, of which I'm an adjunct member, it's not my college's Wharton, for a whole year and kept a record. And they spent the whole year arguing about the details of required courses in the first year. In my farewell session as a member of the faculty, I got up and pointed out to them that the Carnegie Foundation report had shown that 65% of the graduate engineers do not practice engineering within five years of graduation. What the hell were they arguing about what was required in a first course? I said, furthermore, the Carnegie Report says that 50% of what they learn is no longer valid within five years after they graduate. That it's nonsense to talk about what a student ought to learn. What education ought to be about is a student learning how to learn and being motivated to do so. What he learns is irrelevant. It's going to be out of uh, use. I had a student ask me the other day. He said, Dr. Aikoff, he said, what was the last time you taught a course in a subject that you had when you were a student? You know, I hadn't thought about that one before, and I had to think about it. You know what the answer turned out to be? 1951. 34 years. Everything I have taught didn't exist when I was a student just didn't exist. It's our capacity to learn that's important, not what we learn, but we keep acting as though, my God, you really do have to know how to take the derivative of an equation. Mechanical, no understanding. We are in a process of uh, incinerating brains, just it's awful. Comment on teacher competency? It's a big topic in Alabama and Florida. Well, you see, it's the wrong question. We shouldn't have teachers. So what's the point of talking about how competent they are? <laughs> I don't want to know how competent a person is as a teacher. I want to know how competent he is as a facilitator of learning. They're not the same thing. They aren't the same thing at all. <clears throat> I don't believe in teachers. So all this stuff about rewarding for competency in teaching, 
I would like to see rewards for competency and enabling people to learn. There are some exciting schools. There are marvelous experiments going around, but the trouble is that nobody pays attention to them because it requires fundamental change in what they do. If you look, for example, at the American School in London, what an incredible place. Eight classrooms in one big area, each one at a different level. If a kid in the fifth level is having a trouble with a problem, he's just as likely to walk to a kid in the sixth level and ask him how to do it as he is to go to a teacher. A teacher sits in a little cell in the middle with these class groups around here, the kids wandering all over the damn place, learning like mad and excited and having a marvelous time while they do it. And I've never walked into that room and seen a teacher at the front of the class telling them something. But they're constantly learning. The Oak Lane Day School in Philadelphia, run by a friend of mine, and after listening to me go on this way, decided one year to have the second grade students teach the first, the third grade students teach the second, and so on up to the top. Had a marvelous year. The kids thought it was the greatest year they've ever had. And then they got a new headmaster and they changed it all because they were afraid they wouldn't get accredited by doing it that way. The fact that kids were learning didn't matter. Yes, please. The idea of the people in Mexico sending them to the university is why? I'm sorry? Going? The, the people that spent two years uh, in Mexico teaching, you know, I mean, instructing, facilitating, whatever, <coughs> and then you said the reward, I, unless I misunderstood, was the goal of the The reward was they would be supported while they went to a university. Now, they don't have to pay tuition to the university, so you don't have to offer them that. But the kid from the village couldn't afford to live in the city in which the university was located. So what he got was a, a, a subsidy for living, a stipend. Otherwise, he couldn't have gone to a college. So is the university and the those terms treated still as a source of storage of knowledge? Well, you know, university is the worst of all. Uh, well, why would can you go to the university? That's my question. Well, because they want to. The fact is that going to the university doesn't educate them, but it gives them access to situations in which they can get educated, in which they can learn. C can I tell you a little story about university design? Uh, when Echeverria was president of Mexico, when he was inaugurated, he made a promise to the Mexican public that by the end of his presidency, which is six years, <coughs> Every graduate of high school in Mexico would have an opportunity to go to a university. That was his commitment. Uh, about one year before the end of his term, only about 50% of the applicants from high school graduates were getting into universities. There wasn't enough room. Now, the University of Mexico, the National University of Mexico, it's actually the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, is the second largest university in the world, 125,000 students. It's in Mexico City. He called the rector of the university, who was a man by the name of Soberon at the time, and said, I'm in a hole. I've only got a year to go, and I've made this commitment. I'm getting political pressure on me. What I want you to do within the next six months is build and open five new campuses each one to accommodate 30,000 students. How do you like that for a job? Mm -hmm. Build from scratch on open fields five new university campuses, each to accommodate 30,000 students. That's bigger than the University of Pennsylvania or Harvard or Yale. Five of them. Now, it turned out to be marvelous. Why? We only had five months to do it in, in total. There wasn't time to consult the faculty. So Soberon declared an emergency, set up a planning group, and said, you go ahead and we got to do it, however it comes out. And that's a, an incredible circumstance. We didn't have to get faculty approval on anything. Show you what was done. He said to us, I've only got one educational idea I want to impose on a design. I want to get rid of disciplines, departments. He said, I want to organize knowledge into four categories. He said, the language of humanities and science, two categories. The methods 
of the humanities. So. Then he took us through all the subjects normally taught and showed us how they fell into these categories. For example, statistics will be part of the methods of science. Uh, learning uh, history would be a part, historiography would be the methods of humanities, and so on. So that's the only thing I want on. Now let me show you the university that was designed. It was a three-year curriculum because that's what it takes to get a bachelor's degree in Mexico. And each semester, the student takes one course from each of these four areas, plus a fifth course that I'll explain in a moment. <coughs> The university was designed in the following way. There's a block of offices. <clears throat> you enter this room here, and there were five offices. One, two, three, four, five. In each one, in this office was one member of the faculty from the language of the humanities, and this one, one from the language of science, and so on. So there are four faculty members, one from each of the four divisions. And then a secretary in the middle, and this is a conference room. On each side of this room is a classroom, and that classroom belonged to those four instructors. Okay? Now what a student did is he signed up with a cell of four faculty members. And he took the courses that they gave. And the fifth thing was he took a seminar from the four of them jointly, working on a problem of national development that was real. So every curriculum, every year, consisted of five courses, one in each of the four divisions, plus the one on a real development problem in Mexico. This turned out to be in perfect balance, two classrooms for one group of four, and that belonged to them. That was their space for the year. This group of faculty could reorganize themselves at the end of each year. It wasn't a permanent arrangement. There were no departments. Five of these cells constituted an administrative unit, or 20 people, and they had a chairman. And they were simply grouped. Now, there was something called the physics department, but it had nothing to do with any of this. It was a club. The physicists who wanted to get together and talk physics could, but it had no relationship to the curriculum or anything else. Now, next thing. In Mexico, they run the school system like we do, two semesters and a summer off. Why? Because we do. Why do we do it? Because the summer is hot and it's a nice time to vacation, so we give the summer off and have the kids go to school during a lousy time of the year. Remember, universities start in the northeast, not out in the sun belt. So we said, that's nonsense. The weather is absolutely uniform through most of the year in Mexico. So let's divide the year into trimesters. First trimester, second and third. Let's take first year, second year, and third year. Okay. We said a student will come into this university, it'll take classes the first semester, classes the sem second semester, and then he'll go into work in a organization, government or private, that's related to the field of his interest. So he's going to work out here in a company. It's a cooperative program. In the second year, he will take classes, work, and take classes. Okay? In his third year, he will work, take classes, and classes. Now, two very important things happen. First of all, we could go out to government agencies and companies and say, we want you to take X students to work here. But unlike any other cooperative program, you will always have the same number of students here. You're not going to have a bunch during the summer and none the rest of the time. Furthermore, you won't have to waste any time training them because we'll have the second year students train the first year students. We'll have the third year students train the second year students. And in that way, they'll really learn what they're doing. We had no trouble getting these cooperative programs, but something much more important happened. How many students will be in the university at a time? two-thirds. Therefore, we built facilities at a third less the cost than they had expected to pay because we built it for only two-thirds of students. Those five campuses exist today. And the University of Mexico considers it to be their, their stars. 
Well, it was done under a great rush, under tremendous pressure and the rest of it. But it, I only give it to you to give an indication of how unbound we really are by the existing system. If we don't depart from it very much, it's because we don't want to, or we're afraid to, not because it can't be done. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to bring it to a close by telling you a story about one of my other children, if I might, my son. When he was about uh, seven years old, I got home one night and my wife said to me, you're going to have to talk to Alan and punish him. I said, oh my God, what did he do now? She said he hit Karen. And Karen is our daughter who was 17 months younger than my son. And we're supposed to be a nonviolent family, and so that's a no-no. And so I had to punish him. This was a division of labor between my wife and me. She would find out what they did wrong, and I would punish them. <laughs> so I found him around. I said, Alan, I want to see you right after supper in my study. And he said, okay. He knew what it was about. So after supper, he came in, and he sat across there. He wasn't taking it very seriously. Well, I started to give him help explain that violence is not a desirable thing, particularly against the weaker sex. I had a lot of trouble extending this out because I had a great deal of sympathy with what he had done. <laughs> and uh, after a little bit, I paused, and that was a serious mistake. Because when I paused, he immediately broke in and he asked me a question. He said, Daddy, do you know what the one skeleton in the closet said to the other? <laughs> now, any parent with any sense would have ignored that and gone on giving him hell, but I didn't. <laughs> what I said is no. And he said, the skeleton said if we had any guts, we'd get out of here. <laughs> 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 